I'm Phil Ponce. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday, October 30th. Coming up on Chicago Tonight, the latest from the fall veto session in Springfield. Boeing executives face Congress and the families of crash victims. And an opera based on a best-selling book and hit movie. But first, the end of the Chicago teachers' strike may be in sight. At this hour, the CTU's House of Delegates is meeting to discuss a potential contract deal. Brandis Friedman is live from CTU headquarters. And Brandis, what is the latest? So, Phil, that meeting, as you mentioned, it is still going on here at CTU headquarters right behind me. Um, when calling this meeting a few hours ago, CTU Vice President Stacey Davis Gates said that the union leadership had reached, quote, a monumental agreement uh, on, and they would take it to their membership tonight if the mayor would agree to make up the school days that have been lost during this strike at the end of the year. Now, Mayor Lori Lightfoot has repeatedly said that she does not intend to do that. In fact, sources say that talk of making up these school days never came up during the more than three hour meeting that she and her staff had with CTU leadership yesterday to hash out uh, the last details uh, before last night's House of Delegates meeting. I'm told it did come up during bargaining today, but the city's answer was the same as it's always been, and that was a no. So for now, the last day of school for students is scheduled for June 16th. Now that's before any snow days get added in. Adding these 10 strike days would take the school year to June 30th all day. So tonight's vote could be putting pressure on the mayor to make up those days and in the strike, getting teachers back into the classroom uh, before their health insurance is canceled this Friday. That's if a vote happens tonight. We are still waiting to hear from CTU on what's going on behind me. Now, all day I have been hearing, though, a lot of back and forth about what could happen tonight and that rank and file membership may be split over whether or not to approve this tentative agreement. For example, one delegate told me that she took the pulse of her school's membership and it was a very close vote, but the ones who opposed the deal actually had a slight majority. So I'm sure in light of whatever happens here tonight, we'll probably be hearing from the school district about whether or not classes are indeed canceled for tomorrow, especially if they don't vote, then we know that the district will cancel classes for tomorrow. Of course, we're waiting to hear the outcome of this House of Delegates meeting. Earlier today, though, the mayor said that she did, uh, she was hopeful that the the union leadership would have this deal presented to their House of Delegates this evening and consider the offer they put on the table. She also says that she is not surprised by the length of this strike and she admits that more work could have been done earlier. There's a lot of work that we could have done sooner, but um, we didn't start to do really until after the strike was over. But what I'm hopeful for today is this has been a long um, journey. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of um, harm that's been done to our young people. Now that was early this morning when she visited students affected by the strike at a park on the south side. She re-emphasized the terms of the city's offer, a 16% pay increase for teachers, plus meeting the CTU's demands on class sizes and staffing. We have done everything that they've asked <clears throat> and more. So I'm hopeful that they see that. They see that the contract is one of value. A half a billion dollars isn't something to sneeze at. Now, Lightfoot goes on uh, in that press conference this morning to praise the contract agreement that was reached between the city and SEIU Local 73, which was ratified, we're told today, by 97% of members. Uh, this includes bus aides, custodians, special education, classroom assistants, and other workers. Today, the union celebrated its contract victory, saying it means higher wages for its lowest paid members, that's those who are making less than $35,000 a year, who they say are mostly black and brown women. Our SICAs, bus aides, parent workers, custodians, security officers, and all of our other members at um, Chicago Public Schools are actually the backbone that makes Chicago operate. Um, that they are the backbones of our school systems. These are the individuals that take care of our students, um, you know, from one end of the city to the other, and make sure that our schools are clean so that they can learn in a, a healthy environment. This contract means a lot to me, personally. It means equity. It means putting us on a progressive track to come out of poverty. Mm -hmm. yes. We yes. Yes. 
Now, we know those SEIU Local 73 members, despite having a contract, they uh, entered this strike uh, in solidarity with CTU. So if there are picket lines tomorrow or Friday, uh, those SEIU members say that they achieved their contract because of that solidarity. They will remain in it and they will remain on the picket line with CTU. Meanwhile, with regards to the CTU contract, we know there are a few things still outstanding as far according to CTU, uh, especially teacher prep time as well as veteran pay for those senior level teachers. Um, I'm hearing from city sources as far as the mayor is concerned, those issues have been settled in this offer. Of course, we will have to wait and see what the House of Delegates does this evening before we find out whether in fact they have been settled and the two sides have reached a tentative agreement. Phil, we're still waiting. Brandis, thank you and keep us posted on what's happening, please. Well, one way or another, the teacher strike will end at some time and then there will be fallout. Who will be the political winners and losers? Plus, what another federal indictment of a sitting lawmaker says about the U.S. attorney's efforts to root out corruption. Our spotlight political team of Parrish Schutz and Carol Marine dig into these issues and more. Okay, we just heard from Bandis that uh, there may be this one whole hiccup regarding uh, law school days, but uh, uh, at this point, uh, assuming that a contract is, is achieved in the next day or two, let's hope, uh, political winners and losers, Carol? You know, Phil, I think it still is a bit too soon to tell because what I heard from Brandis just now is that <clears throat> the the union doesn't think that they have worked it out on prep time and the union doesn't believe that they've worked it out on some other issues. So I, I don't know. I think the longer this goes, everybody and the teacher to the city side loses. SEIU in its two unions, I think, have won something by virtue of their strike and by solidarity with the teachers. But right now, the longer it goes, the mayor and the teachers are, are both going to take some nicks in their armor for this. Talk about Paris, the there, was a, there was a poll released today that indicated that, uh, that public support for the teachers has dropped and that public support for the mayor has dropped. And, and it would be consistent with where public support was at the beginning of this, where they supported the teachers and they supported the mayor. It wasn't a zero-sum game, although I, I would not put a lot of stock in, in polling at this point. Phil, let's talk about who the other real losers are right now, the students and the parents who have endured two weeks of this. Um, and uh, if, if this does indeed go on, as Carol said, there's going to be no winners. The mayor's not going to win. The CTU is not going to win. Right now, the CTU is going back to its members saying they have a monumental deal. But from what I heard from Brandis and everything I'm looking at in the latest offer, nothing's really changed much in the last few days. They could have settled this a few days ago, uh, and they chose not to. Carol, one of the CTU's apparent last-minute demands had to do with uh, uh, asking the mayor or having the mayor commit to support an elected school board bill. Is that going to happen? You know, I don't know if it is, but I think what the dynamic we see here, Phil, is that the, the teachers are taking to the mayor her, what they perceive were her campaign promises. And for every one of these controversies and issues, it's going to be, remember what you told us you believed in, and now that you're mayor, are you going to support it? And so that's going to be kind of the tension between a progressive who got elected on a certain agenda and whether she's fulfilling it as an elected official. And the word is the teachers union wanted a labor agreement conditioned on Mayor Lightfoot's support of an elected school board bill in Springfield. What I'm hearing from the mayor is she gave no assurances on any of the teachers union initiatives uh, in Springfield or any assurances that she was going to support that elected school board bill because Phil, she opposed it. She said she supports the idea of an elected school board bill, but the one sponsored by former representative and now state senator Rob Martwick, she says is too unruly. It would have 21 elected members. But what's happening today is Martwick, who is the sponsor now in the Senate, says he's gotten assurance from the Senate president that at least the General Assembly is going to take it up. They're going to hear it. They're going to debate it in spring. Speaker Madigan put out a statement saying he supports moving CTU bills in the spring, as does Governor Pritzker. So that could have been what came out of negotiations in the last few days, that legislative leaders in Springfield will agree to at least hear this bill and move it along, if not support it. Carol, speaking of Springfield, uh, the mayor's relying on Springfield to help the city out of its budget mess. What are, what's the likelihood that that help will be forthcoming? 
Uh, there isn't a great likelihood, Phil, because Governor Pritzker has got his own world of hurt in red ink. He's got his own progressive income tax agenda. And while he certainly is sympathetic to Mayor Lightfoot, I think there is in Springfield a sense that not enough groundwork has been done, has been laid for the governor to sort of be able to deliver what the mayor really feels she needs. And the, the, there does seem to be movement on, on a bill or a proposal to reopen the Chicago casino proposal and change the tax structure around, Phil, which didn't look like it was going to happen. But it doesn't seem like there's any support for a real estate transfer tax, a change in that Springfield would, uh, would authorize a graduated real estate transfer tax where higher properties would pay more. This is what Mayor Lori Lightfoot wants. She wants $50 million from this to close the budget this year. It doesn't look like she's going to get that. Uh, and there's opposition on all sides. Uh, Black Caucus in Springfield said, we're not going to support this unless a majority of that fund or those funds are earmarked toward homelessness. Lightfoot said, why would we just commit ourselves to one thing like that? So that's one thing that does not look like it's going to get solved. But there is still a week left. As you both know, multiple news reports uh, out this week say that State Senator Terry Link is the unnamed cooperating witness who was wearing a wire in a federal case against State Representative Luis Arroyo. Remind us who uh, Senator Link is. He's an assistant majority leader in the Senate. He's been in the General Assembly for a long time. He represents parts of the North Shore, Waukegan, Lincolnshire. He has been the main person pushing gambling and gaming expansion. We're looking at uh, Luis Arroyo right here. But Senator Link has been the main person pushing gambling expansion for the better part of the last decade. Uh, so he's been intimately involved in all these gaming bills. Link, to his credit, adamantly denies these reports, says he has nothing to do with it. But if, if he was wearing a wire, it begs the question, who else was picked up on his wiretaps? Carol, the feds have made a big show, as you know, of uh, raiding offices in broad daylight. And yet, Arroyo's charge seemed to come out of nowhere. What do you make of the timing? Well, here's my theory on that, Phil. And not unlike Rob Blagojevich, who was yanked out of bed right on the cusp of the potentially him selling a Senate seat, I think the timing with Arroyo may depend on the fact that he was trying, according to the feds, to make a deal for this veto session. Mm. They couldn't wait on the basis of that. They were going to have to put a stop to it. And so <clears throat> from what we can see, and, and think about this, Phil, if that's the case, this is after Danny Solis has emerged, Ed Burke has been indicted. What did Luis Arroyo not read in the paper or hear in the news about the feds all over the place when he was allegedly trying to make a deal for a lobby lobbying client of his in behalf of a gaming expansion. We're almost out of time, Paris, but uh, is there any political fallout from uh, Trump's visit to Chicago and uh, his uh, criticism and this, his, the, quote, feud between him and Superintendent Eddie Johnson? I think, think it was a smart political play by Superintendent Johnson not to attend. I think it was nothing more than politics uh, because Eddie Johnson's under fire now for this incident where he was caught in his car after a few drinks, slumped over the wheel, is now being investigated by the IG. So, the president's not very popular in Chicago. You, you, you can score some political points by saying, I'm going to stand on my principle and not show up and perhaps divert some attention uh, to some of the, the more problematic things are be, that are being discussed with respect to Johnson right now. Comrades, that's where we'll have to leave it. Paris Carroll, a pleasure as always. Ditto. <laughs> and up next, we check in with Amanda Vinicky for the latest from the state capitol. Now we turn to Springfield, where the fate of Chicago's casino, pension consolidation, and vaping restrictions hang in the balance as lawmakers this afternoon wrapped up the first half of the fall veto session. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky joins us now from the Capitol. Amanda. Phil, those were supposed to have been the key issues, but Monday's shocking indictment of Representative Luis Arroyo for allegedly bribing a fellow lawmaker who, by the way, was working with the feds and wearing a wire, well, that overshadowed everything. So 
major issues do remain in limbo. Nonetheless, legislators did move forward on other matters, like the House moving to ban ethylene oxide. That's a chemical used to sterilize medical equipment. A company, Sterogenics, closed down its operations in Willowbrook after an immense backlash from local residents and after they filed a lot of lawsuits accusing the company's emissions of causing cancer. But there are other medical sterilization plants that use E2O, including in Waukegan, Medline. I have children that are dying. Point is just that simple. I have children that are dying. The number one cause of death in Cook County is heart disease. The number one cause of death in my community is cancer. Ethylene oxide is a class A carcinogen. It is cancerous to people. Mayfield's bill, which would effectively again ban the use of ethylene oxide, passed the House, but barely. Medline says it's installing controls that will capture 99.9% of emissions, and critics say that a ban could have harmful consequences. Just last week, the FDA put out an alert that says this backlash over ETO is could potentially lead to a shortage of sterile medical devices. And the Illinois Chamber of Commerce putting out a statement saying, this legislation will have significant ramifications for the healthcare medical or material supply chain and could result in shortages of sterilized devices and materials. Now, moving on, another bill passed the House. This would allow for student athletes to take paid endorsement deals. The NCAA has become a billion dollar enterprise and they've done it off the names, likenesses and images of student athletes who make nothing. Former er, Representative Welch himself, a former college athlete, says that this could also help Illinois universities better recruit, but critics say it is going to make college sports all about money. I think it's wrong. I think it's sad. With this vote today, it's clearly going to pass by the comments people are making. But with this vote today, you're inserting that dagger right in the heart of amateur, amateur athletics here in Illinois. Other bills that advanced include a ban on vaping in bars and other public places indoors. Also, a measure that would cap out-of-pocket costs for insulin. What about Mayor Lightfoot's agenda? She needs the legislature to make changes to the tax structure of a Chicago casino, casino, and she wants permission to implement a graduated tax on home sales. Phil, neither of those issues advanced, though Lightfoot's legislative lobbying team was definitely here working it, and also I'm told that she has been on the phone calling lawmakers to try to get them on board. It is in Governor J.B. Pritzker's best interest, as well as that of other lawmakers, to get a deal on a Chicago casino because the city is counting on revenue from it to go to toward paying for pensions, but the state would get a cut from a Chicago casino revenue as well, and that would help pay for Pritzker's prized infrastructure program. Pritzker's own priority for the veto session, and that is consolidation of downstate and suburban pension funds, also didn't get much attention this week. We do have language, a bill introduced, but didn't go anywhere. That is in part because negotiations are still ongoing. But it's also, again, because Representative Arroyo's arrest really did overshadow everything. Also, the unease of what else the FBI might have heard on the wire that that lawmaker slash informant was wearing. Now, to that end, legislators move forward on a couple of ethics measures, the beginning steps to forming a task force that will look at what all else they can do. And Senate Republicans introduced a plan that will give more power to the legislative watchdog. There is today uh, multiple ongoing criminal allegations, complaints, arrests that have been made of our colleagues, and we need not wait till the spring to decide that we can't police ourselves. Legislators will have the opportunity to take up that and all of these matters when they return for the second half of the veto session, November 12th. By then, it could be that Representative Arroyo will be on his way to no longer being a member of the Illinois House. Proceedings begin on Friday to expel him. Phil. Amanda, thank you. Thanks, Phil.
Boeing executives face questions from Congress again today following two international crashes, one earlier this year and one in 2018. Together, they killed a total of 346 people. Boeing 737 MAX aircraft has been grounded since the crashes. The hearings focused on safety concerns and the status of the plane. We can and must do better. We've been challenged and changed by these accidents. We've made mistakes and we got some things wrong. We're improving and we're learning and we're continuing to learn. Here to tell us more about what's happening on the Hill is David Shaper. He's a correspondent on NPR's National Desk. David, thank you for being here. Uh, what was the mood in the chamber today? This is the second day of the hearing on this faulty flight control system. Uh, what, was the, what was the vibe? I, I would describe it in both days as, as, as a bit somber and a bit intense. Uh, but, but today, I think the intensity ratcheted up a little bit. You've got, you know, members of the House, there are more of them. Uh, there seemed to be more anger directed towards uh, Dennis Mullenberg, the CEO of Boeing and, and the Boeing company as a whole. Uh, there, there's a lot of frustration from people over these crashes and, and the kind of what did they know and when did they know it? When did the company know that there were problems with this plane and, and uh, you know, why weren't they addressed before these planes were in the air? What were some of the key points that the CEO made today? Well, the CEO was was certainly uh, apologetic as in the clip that you just saw. He acknowledged that there were mistakes made by the company uh, throughout this this the development process, and, uh, and and even in the communications with the airlines, with communications with uh, various uh, uh, agencies of regulation, regulator agencies around the world after the the crashes, uh, and he communicated a, a lot of uh, a little bit more uh, of in detail about some of the problems they experience but he was also deflective of a lot of things whether or not there's a culture problem at Boeing and where where you know improving profitability and improving market share and improving uh, st uh, shareholder value is more important at times than safety he, he certainly denied all of that so safety because is the been, number one there had been assertions that the culture has changed in Boeing since they took over ri rival McDonald I've, I've talked to engineers who are who are still there and I've talked to engineers who uh, have left the company who say that there's been a dramatic shift uh, over the years at, at Boeing, uh, that there there is more of a, a a corporate culture of of the bottom line and and making sure that this company's value soars. Uh, it's not that safety isn't a top concern; it's just not the top concern all the time, and that what worries a lot of people, both inside and outside of the company. So uh, on Tuesday, Senator Ted Cruz asked why the 2016 pilot messages were not turned over until earlier this year. What messages was he referring to? He's referring to some some internal messages, some instant messages between some technical pilots, the chief technical pilots and one of his uh, underling pilots, who is now actually the chief uh, technical pilot. Uh, and, and these were messages describing some problems with this MCAS flight control system as they were testing out the, the new 737 MAX in a simulator. And, and the, the one, the chief pilot describes the, the problem is egregious and and fighting him and him losing control of the aircraft and and he actually uh, says that gee maybe I lied to regulators when I said that this plane was okay and this uh, description of this this system doesn't need to be in the manual yet that same pilot went on to uh, to later tell regulators that yeah everything's okay that this, this is this is a plane is good to fly this system is is good to go how about victims uh, were there victim statements uh, they were not, uh, they were present, but they did not give statements to the committee. They were cert their presence was felt throughout, though. They had uh, a lot of uh, uh, photographs and, and signs uh, uh, of, of the victims who so were in the crash. These family members uh, have been very uh, vocal about their uh, desire to see things change. And actually, uh, Dennis Mullenberg, the CEO of Boeing, said he met with them between yesterday's hearing and today's hearing. It was quite an emotional meeting. Uh, and, and he has acknowledged that there have been problems uh, th at the company, that if they knew then what they knew now, they would have shut down the, the 737 MAX after the first crash, so there wouldn't have been a second crash. However, there's also some documents that show that they knew about some problems after that first crash that, that should have been addressed, and, and, and they still let the, kept the planes flying, and a second plane did crash. What about Boeing's liability? I mean, what's, what's going on with uh, lawsuits by families of the victims? There, there are all kinds of lawsuits being filed by families of the victims. A lot of them want to be heard here in Chicago. That's where the company is based. Uh, so there are 
or many uh, filed in the courts here. However, Boeing, uh, from a legal strategy, has been working up a, a strategy of moving these cases out of the United States entirely and to the countries where the planes crashed. Why? Because that they believe, and, and from some documents that have been discovered, uh, that they, they would face less liability if it's not heard in the U.S. When asked about that, uh, CEO Mullenberg denied any knowledge of that kind of a legal strategy, even though it's been reported on publicly. And uh, the, he said that's something that's totally up to the to our legal counsel. I'm, I'm not aware of that. And uh, several experts I've talked to and a, and a lot of the lawmakers commenting on in the uh, hearing today said that really doesn't pass the smell test. David Shaper, thank you so much. My pleasure. Appreciate your insights. And for more on the story, you can visit our website. The Chicago Police Department is ordered to make some changes and do a better job of solving murders. Paris Schutz has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Paris. Phil, the Chicago Police Department is vowing that those changes can lead to solving more murders. A new report commissioned by the U.S. Department of Justice is recommending several reforms to improve CPD's clearance rate. Among them, create a dedicated homicide detective unit, expand the number of detective areas in the city from three back to five, and provide basic and advanced training for homicide detectives. The report found that Chicago's murder clearance rate was 36 percent in 2017, lower than that of New York, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia. The report's author says it's a wake-up call for the department, but says he's confident the mayor and police superintendent will adopt the changes. I'm not going to whitewash this and say that this was a positive report. It wasn't. The difference is, is you have a roadmap now where you're going, and you have it, uh, uh, folks in place with the mayor and the superintendent who are committed to fixing it. They're not in denial. No city sticker for your car yet? You have until tomorrow to get one without paying late fees and back charges. City Clerk Ana Valencia says if residents purchase city stickers by the end of the day tomorrow, they can apply to have up to three tickets for failure to have a sticker forgiven. Residents can purchase stickers at one of three locations, including downtown at City Hall, or visit the city clerk's website. Chicago's tree trimming program could use a bit of a haircut. This according to a new report issued by City Inspector General Joe Ferguson. That report found that hundreds of thousands of trees hadn't been trimmed in more than 10 years because the city relies on residents to call 311 to request the action. Ferguson recommends the city move to a more standardized, grid-based approach, which he says could get rid of that backlog and reduce the average cost per trim by 60%. As for the weather, rain tonight possibly mixed with some snow and a low around 35 and then a mix of more rain and snow tomorrow, becoming all snow by mid-Halloween morning with a high of only 33. Now, Phil, back to you. Thanks, Paris. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, college athletes could soon make money from endorsement deals. We explain the debate. The journey to bring dead man walking to the opera house. How did a replica of a Chicago statue end up south of the border find out in tonight's ask jeffrey and it's changed the understanding of the beginnings of human civilization the oriental institute gives its museum a multi-million dollar makeover to mark its centennial but first some of today's top business headlines from cranes here's danny ecker Bill, Chicago is adding another high-profile corporate headquarters to its roster, though it's not quite clear what it means for jobs here. Beer giant Molson Coors said today it's moving its North American headquarters from Denver to Chicago. It's part of a broader change that includes eliminating 400 to 500 of its corporate jobs in North America and retiring the Miller Coors name. The Miller Coors division has been based in Chicago since 2008 and accounted for about two-thirds of Molson Coors sales. It's one of the first big moves by new Molson Coors CEO Gavin Hattersley as he faces declining or flat sales of staples like Miller Lite and Coors Light. Meantime, a Chicago developer has purchased part of the former Maywood Park horse track with plans to put a retail project there geared mainly toward restaurants. A venture of GW Properties principal Mitch Goltz paid $9 million for 15 and a half acres of the big property in Melrose Park. Some restaurants have committed to lease new buildings there while others will buy them. The racetrack closed there in 2015 after 70 years in business, and the venue's owner sold 40 acres earlier this year to another group. It's developing three industrial buildings there, totaling 620,000 square feet. 
And if you own a house in Lake County, the 2017 federal tax reform law did quite a number on the value of your property. A report from Moody's National Housing Economist said that among roughly 3,100 counties in the U.S., Lake County, Illinois, ranked fifth in damage done by the cap on property tax deductions enacted two years ago. The law set a new limit of $10,000 for deducting state and local taxes on federal filings. Lake County's high residential property taxes mean its homes on average will lose almost 10 percent of what they might have been worth seven years after the new tax law, according to the report. Cook County ranked 36th on the list, putting it in the top 2 percent of the nation's hardest hit counties. For Crane's Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Danny Ecker. Phil, back to you. Thanks, Danny. And now to Carol Marine and a big step toward college athletes getting paid. Carol. Phil, thank you. The Illinois House today overwhelmingly voted in favor of a bill letting college athletes profit from their names and likenesses. It comes a day after the NCAA said it was considering loosening rules that prevent student athletes from making money. And earlier this month, California's governor signed into law a measure on which Illinois' law would be based. Joining us to talk about potential changes for student athletes and the reactions sparked by those changes, Fred Mitchell, award-winning former Chicago Tribune sports writer who now teaches at DePaul's College of Communications. Welcome, Fred. Good to see you, Carol. So the NCAA just had this sort of magnanimous change of heart? No, no they've been you know, grudgingly trying to uh, help out student athletes over the past few years and this is certainly a quantum leap and in, in, in direct opposition for what they have uh, stood for in the past but I think what happened in California and, and what's happening around the around the country finally behooved uh, the NCAA to get with the time shall we say. The, their reluctance was because they were making millions and millions of dollars off these student athletes. What, in your judgment, was the injustice of that exactly? Well, you, you have coaches who are making millions of dollars and athletic directors and other administrators, and there's, there's, there's a big pie of, of millions of dollars from bowl games and, and uh, stadiums that seat 100,000 fans on every Saturday for football. Uh, and in basketball, you've, you've got uh, all the money raised there as well. So it was just an imbalance that, that these athletes were creating the, the revenue, basically, uh, for all these people, and they weren't getting any share of, of the pie other than the scholarships. Well, we heard uh, on the floor of the Illinois House today uh, a lawmaker say, I, I think this is going to be voted through, but it takes a dagger through the heart of amateur athletics. Yeah. Uh, is it a slippery slope? Does it drive a dagger through that? I don't know. That might be overstating it a little bit, but... You know, this is, this is not a perfect solution, but it, it is a step in the right direction. There will always be people trying to exploit the system and, and trying to, uh, to, to get by. Uh, but I, I think nowadays this is what you have to do to acknowledge the, the, the time, the effort, and, and the revenue that these athletes bring to universities. It, and it, it helps the entire university with what they do. But on the other hand, those athletes are getting scholarships. Yep. Um, many of them are treated very well. Mm -hmm. They have special dorms, they have special tutors, right. uh, they have great meal plans. Mm -hmm. um, so are they really shortchanged exactly? Well, you know, that's one way to look at it, and certainly most of them do get special privileges. But when you also go beyond that, uh, there's a tremendous uh, responsibility that they have, particularly at the Division I level, in terms of hours of, of, of practice and, and uh, uh, traveling and, and being away from the classroom. Uh, this is a, a terrific sacrifice as well. And, uh, you know, there's really a, a small percentage of those athletes who go on to the professional level. So this, for most athletes, college, this is it. So if you're uh, an excellent college football or basketball player or other athlete uh, and, and you excel but not quite good enough to make it to the professional level, this is an opportunity to, uh, I think, establish a relationship, a business relationship with a potential uh, endorser. Right, so that when they're done with their college and and find out that uh, professional sports is not in their future, they can say, oh, "Remember me?" And uh, I helped sell your product when I was in college. I, I would like to work with you, you know, long term and make a career out of working with your company. That what's, would be the ideal setup. What's the demographic of these college athletes? I mean, are they 
Where do they come from in terms of wealth or privilege or possibilities? Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, a, you know, a wide range, obviously. And I often use the example of the uh, young athlete who comes from maybe a, a single parent situation in, in relative poverty. Let's say he, he's in Florida and he gets a scholarship to the University of Washington in Seattle. And then the mother can't afford to come see her son play football. Uh, that's, you know, I, I see that happening quite a bit and I, I don't think that's fair. You know, when you put more money in the game, you begin to also deal with the possibility of, of not everybody, including the athlete, getting it. Yeah. So agents get a cut of this. Yeah. I mean, at some point, how do you make it good for the athlete and not just another way to exploit the athlete? Right. Well, the NCAA in particular is, is good at the fine print, and I'm sure that by the time they get all this worked out, there will be stipulations about such things. But having said that, uh, you know, this is the real world, and there are always going to be uh, people who are unscrupulous and, and they're going to take advantage of, of people, and uh, they'll, these young men and women will find that out after they get to college, so they might get a lesson a little bit earlier than that. I remember at the University of Tennessee there was a really talented runner uh, who was not a talented student right. and the university kept him for five years. He never, I think, got to like the second class in any sequence. It was always 101s. Mm -hmm. By the time he graduated, when he was no longer eligible to run, he also didn't really have a degree uh, in anything. Mm -hmm. For these athletes, how do you kind of try to guarantee that they walk out of those university doors with a diploma that means something if they're mm -hmm. not going to go on mm -hmm. to the pros? Yeah, I, I think, you know, in, in that fine print that we're talking about, I, I think there should be a, a stipulation that uh, for an athlete to be able to profit off of his or her, her name, uh, there should be a, an academic good standing, right? so that they're not just coasting through, taking the bare minimum uh, to, to stay eligible and, and still profiting from their name. So I think that would be an important stipulation to have. Are universities going to fight this because they want that money and not giving it to the athlete? Yeah, I'm sure there will be some uh, schools feeling that way, but I, I think most schools will be able to figure out a way that that could profit the school as well as the individual. So that if they've got some name uh, athletes out there who, who are, are getting paid uh, to uh, endorse products or whatever uh, that it draws attention to the school. That's so-and-so from the University of Alabama. That's so-and-so from Ohio State, from Notre Dame, whatever school. So I, I think that would be the best way to handle it. There are some models for research scientists that they got to keep the gains of their own researchers, share mm -hmm. it with the university, mm -hmm. share it with the community. Are the, is that kind of the modeling that we're looking at for this? Hopefully, that, that, that would make the most sense and, and get everybody involved and invited to the party. Right now, the athletes aren't invited to the party. It's the, it's the coaches and the, and the administrators who are getting the biggest share of the pie. You think it's pretty much a done deal? I think so. I think the, the door has been open and it's cracked open and uh, uh, the only regrets are for the current athletes and the former athletes who wish they could have benefited from this. Fred Mitchell, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Right, Thanks so her. much. Thank you. Much more ahead on Chicago Tonight. Stay with us. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. It was a moving memoir that became an Oscar-winning 1995 film starring Sean Penn and Susan Sarandon. Dead Man Walking premiered as an opera in 2000, and after more than 60 productions around the world, it is now headed to Lyric Opera of Chicago for the first time. Chicago Tonight got an exclusive invitation for a dress rehearsal today, and recently we spoke with the force behind the film and the opera, Sister Helen Prejean. Dead Man Walking tells the true story of a murderer and the nun who became his spiritual advisor on death row. The first time I went to visit him, uh, they locked me in a room. They said, we'll go get your man. And I was nervous about him. I'd never been with a murderer before. This guy murdered somebody. And uh, then the guards brought him in. I was on the other side of a heavy mesh metal screen. 
And, uh, and I looked through that screen and I went, my God, he's a human being. It's not to make him a hero. He did a terrible crime with his brother of killing two innocent teenage kids. But I got to know him as a human being and I began to learn every human being is worth more than the worst thing they've ever done. The opera features a libretto by Tony Award winner Terence McNally and music by Jake Heggie. Sister Helen Prejean says she didn't know anything about opera, but she had a request. The one thing I did say to Jake Heggie when we talked before he did the opera, like, please don't do that atonal stuff where we can't hum a tune. We gonna have a melody, aren't we, when we leave? What is a nun doing in a place like this? When Tim Robbins was working on the film of Dead Man Walking, he kept saying, the nun is in over her head. And it's really, really true. I was thrown to the criminal justice system. I didn't know how the courts worked. I didn't know that you could really be innocent and be condemned to death. I knew nothing. And this man, walking with this man and accompanying him, his name is Pat Sonier, was the first. And since then, I have accompanied six people to execution, and I'm with a seventh man on death row now. But the opera of Dead Man Walking is about more than the death penalty. It's about dealing with deep hurt, either against us or people we love, and how you come out of that. That's an equal part of the journey. Everybody in the opera of Dead Man Walking is on a journey. She has a new memoir about her spiritual awakening called River of Fire. The reason I'm out on the road giving talks, the reason I wrote the books, the reason I'm glad about the opera and the film of Dead Man Walking and getting it out there is because I witnessed what it means to render a human being completely defenseless, which you don't even do with prisoners of war. The Geneva Convention, she cannot take a prisoner of war tie his hands behind his back, lead him to a wall and shoot him. It's the killing of a defenseless person that is the moral atrocity in the act. I believe if executions were public, we'd shut down the death penalty tomorrow. The seeing of that act is what, where you recognize it for what it is. And the opera of Dead Man Walking, of course, it's through the prism of murder and execution, but the real journey is gonna be in the hearts of people and going into, we all know personal hurt of people we love who've been hurt. And how do you get out of that? Do you put your energies into getting even or is there a whole way so that you can come out intact as a loving, intact whole person without giving in to the rage and the anger? Dead Man Walking opens this Saturday at Lyric Opera of Chicago. It has six performances through November 22nd. And there's more with Sister Helen on our website. And we're back with Paris Schutz and an encore presentation of Ask Jeffrey right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. The statue of a standing Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln Park is instantly recognizable to Chicagoans, even when it's in Mexico City, which is where a WTTW producer spotted an exact replica of the Chicago Monument. So how did Honest Abe wind up standing around south of the border? Yo no sé, but Jeffrey Bayer has the answer in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. Jeffrey, great to see you. Good to be here. Okay, so our first letter comes from in-house, our yeah. WTTW colleague Dan Prochet. He says, greetings from Mexico City. Last night I was in Parque Lincoln and I saw this statue. Look familiar? The plaque said it was a gift from the United States. Did someone copy St. Gaudens Standing Lincoln from Chicago's very own Parque Lincoln? Well, that that is uh, from our questioner, Dan Protest, and he's referencing the, the uncanny similarity between the sculpture that you just saw in Mexico City uh, with uh, the, the famous Standing Lincoln in Chicago's Lincoln Park. It's considered one of the most important works of 
certainly, probably at least, the greatest American sculptor of the 19th century, Augustus St. Gaudens. Um, here he shows Lincoln deep in thought as he rises to give a speech. This was unveiled in 1887, and it deeply influenced other artists' depictions of the slain president. So Dan Protest, the producer, and I have um, featured this, this standing Lincoln statue in any number of our shows. You can imagine how surprised Dan was to see it uh, in Mexico City. All right, so to his question, how did it end up in Mexico City? Well, a duplicate of a it. A duplicate, yes. You, you, you can thank President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, for that. Um, uh, he commissioned the work in 1964 as sort of a goodwill gesture, a gift to the people of Mexico to kind of reinvigorate U.S.-Mexican relations. And in researching this, look at this, we found out that there are four more duplicates. One of them is in, in London, right in front of Parliament. One of them is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Then there's one at a cemetery in Los Angeles. And there's even one at St. Gaudens Home and Studio in New Hampshire, which is now a National Historic Site. Okay, so how does this all work? Does someone um, give uh, give the country the rights to the original to, yeah. just, to just copy? Yeah, who has the rights? Right. So uh, that's exactly what I wondered. So um, I, I consulted a noted St. Gaudens expert. Her name is Thayer Tolles. She's a, a curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And she told me that after Augustus St. Gaudens died, his wife, Augusta, they were known as Gus and Gussie, how about that? Really? Yeah. Um, so Augusta, who you see here, controlled the rights to duplicate works that St. Gaudens had copyrighted. And she made miniature reproductions and sold uh, them uh, to make money to live on of many of St. Gaudens' famous works, but the standing Lincoln was never copyrighted. It belonged to the Lincoln Park Commission, and when Gussie asked to make copies, they voted unanimously to, quote, never permit any replicas to be made. Um, Augusta then appealed to none other than President Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln himself, to intervene, and the Parks Commission uh, did eventually grant permission to her uh, to, quote, aid the widow. And they also seem to have granted permission to uh, have plaster molds made um, from the sculpture so that that London, the first one, the London reproduction, could be made in 1920, um, full-sized reproduction. Uh, today, the work uh, is in public domain, and there's a plaster cast of it, which is stored at the St. Gaudens historic site. And just to clarify, the Lincoln Park one is the original. The Lincoln Park one is the, absolutely the original. Okay, so besides the standing Lincoln, are there other uh, works of St. Gaudens in Chicago? Yeah, there are many. Um, we're showing you two of them right here, uh, both in Grant Park, uh, a sculpture of Civil War General John A. Logan, um, and another Lincoln, actually. This is the seated Lincoln in Grand Park. Yeah, okay, let's get to our next letter. It's from John Rohr in Darien. He says, when I was a child, I was awed by my first visit to the Novelty Golf Course in Lincolnwood. <laughs> I recently met a relative from that neighborhood and was astonished to hear that it not only is still there, but virtually unchanged from the 1950s. Tell me about the history and the owners of this attraction. Well, I love that place. I don't know if awe is the right word <laughs> for it. Um, uh, the family owned and operated Novelty Golf uh, has been at uh, the, the intersection of Lincoln Avenue and Devon, that's on Chicago's northwest side, for about 70 years. Um, as our viewers said, they've stayed uh, true to the old-fashioned miniature golf style with foot pedal operated <laughs> moving obstacles and quirky oh fiberglass God. figures guarding each hole. We talked to Craig Klatsko, who was part of the third of four generations of the Klatsko family to own and operate the course. He said his grandparents, Rose and Louis Klatsko, and their son Buddy, bought an existing but subpar mini golf course at Devon and Lincoln in 1964 and made a bunch of improvements. They added batting cages, they added a game room, and this place, we all know it on the northwest side, the Bunny Absolutely. Hutch hot dog stand. Um, the Klatsko family also owned Hollywood Kitty Land, which was a small amusement park near Devon and McCormick. Wow, and I, I've eaten at the Bunny Hutch and I've taken swings at the batting cages there. there. All right, so the landscaping on that course uh, looks uh, a little different than a standard golf yeah, course. Yeah, check this out. Um, it's pretty unusual. The two courses, there's two courses at Novelty Golf, they have two courses, um, are separated by plantings of flower beds and even fruits and vegetables. And Klatsko said that one visitor actually started picking some hmm. of the produce while she was playing golf there. Wow. And I understand that uh, WTTW helped reunite a chicken couple for Novelty Golf. Can you please tell me what <laughs> this is so referring to? That's right. Back in 1992, uh, Novelty Golf was featured on the iconic WTTW program, Wild Chicago. And here it is. And in the course of that program, uh, Craig's brother, Richard Klatsko, mentioned that one pair uh, of... Hey, 
uh, one of a pair of eight foot tall chickens had gone missing from the course <laughs> and he begged the public for its return. Um, after the episode aired, he got a call from a viewer <laughs> who said they spotted the chicken while riding the L. Klatsko says he found the free range chicken in a Ravenswood backyard. The owner claimed to know nothing about where this big chicken in her backyard came from, um, but it still had a property of novelty golf uh, uh, paint, painted on the foot of the chicken, so Craig was able to. The chicken wasn't riding alone, was it? Uh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> um, so, do we know anything about where mini golf came from? We do. Um, uh, it can trace its origins back to the famous St. Andrews uh, Golf Course the, in Scotland. There was a putting only course at St. Andrews created for women uh, because back then taking a full swing with a golf club was uh, considered unladylike. Um, and early mini golf courses. Um, like this one, were just miniature versions of regular golf courses. But in, in 1929, uh, a Georgia man, Garnet Carter, built a goofy mini golf course with wacky obstacles uh, to entertain guests at his tourist trap, which people have probably heard of, Lookout Mountain in Georgia. Thank you, Jeffrey. Sure thing. And you can watch the Wild Chicago segment and find out more about Standing Lincoln and other stories on our website. And while you're there, don't forget to tap in your questions about Chicago to Jeffrey Bayer. Ask Jeffrey on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Benny's Beverage Depot. In 1948, Benny's Beverage Depot opened its first store down the street from Wrigley Field. And for over 70 years, Benny's mission has remained the same helping you celebrate the best times of your life. On Chicago's South Side, there's a relatively small but academically renowned museum whose founder, James Henry Breasted, helped rewrite the history of human civilization and was reportedly the inspiration for Steven Spielberg's character, Indiana Jones. And now, just in time for its centennial, the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago has completed a five-year, multi-million dollar makeover of the museum that bears its name. It showcases the spectacular archaeological treasures unearthed by OI Expeditions. We recently stopped by for a visit and Parachutes gives us another look. The OI was founded 100 years ago by James Henry Breasted, who was the first American Egyptologist. And he had a radical idea that civilization, that um, who we are and how we came to live as humans together, didn't originate in Greece or Rome. Christopher Woods is the director of the Oriental Institute. Breasted was a scholar of the ancient Middle East, as was the very first president of the University of Chicago, um, William Rainey Harper, whom Breasted studied with. And uh, as an Egyptologist, he knew a lot about these civilizations and so had an inherent interest and knowledge in them and understood that so much of what the West is has, uh, owes its debt to these civilizations in, in the Middle East. With the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I, Breasted undertook a series of archaeological expeditions. Breasted really was a visionary. He understood the moment was now. When he got the initial grant from Rockefeller to create the OI, he went on this epic 11-month voyage throughout the Middle East, and it was uh, you know, the stuff of, of legend, and, and it had its Indiana Jones um, elements to it. But his core, he was a very careful and methodical scholar. Among the largest objects those early expeditions uncovered is an ancient protective deity called a Lamassu, described here by Chief Curator and Deputy Director Gene Evans. This is a monumental, fantastic creature. It's from the Assyrian royal city of Khorzabad, which is in present-day northern Iraq. Um, it dates to the 8th century BC, and this was a protective deity in antiquity would have guarded the entrance to the throne room of the king's palace at Khorzabad. Another monumental piece can be found in the museum's Persian gallery. This wonderful bullhead and actually all of the objects in this gallery are monuments from uh, Persepolis, which was a uh, dynastic capital of the Achaemenid Empire. So this is roughly you know, 550 to 330 BC. The museum also has a large collection of Egyptian artifacts, including statues, mummies, and a wooden coffin that looks like it was painted yesterday. But while the museum's colossal statues and reliefs may first draw the eye, there are many small treasures among the roughly 5,000 objects on display. 
including a tiny piece of the Dead Sea Scrolls and a fragment of a Middle Eastern folktale that has been put on display for the first time. So this is a very unassuming fragment, but it's incredibly important. Um, it's a fragment from the oldest known manuscript of the famous tale of A Thousand and One Nights. There is also a large array of ceramics and human figurines dating back up to 5,000 years and numerous clay cuneiform tablets representing one of the earliest known systems of writing created by the Sumerians of Mesopotamia in what is now Iraq. But perhaps the most significant object on display is also the least impressive to look at. And this basically is the um, Mesopotamian equivalent of the Oxford English Dictionary. Woods says its creation resurrected the language and dialects of the region with all their nuance and thereby shed fresh light on its history. This project, the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, really was one of the great humanistic endeavors of the 20th century. And with a series of events to mark the centennial, Woods hopes that the achievements of the OI will be revealed to a wider audience beyond academia and that the museum that is often referred to as a hidden gem will be hidden no more. For Chicago Tonight, this is Paris Schutz. And you can find out more about the Oriental Institute on our website, where you can also find an interview with Syrian-born artist and architect Mohammed Hafez, whose work is currently being exhibited at the OI. Late news from Teachers Union headquarters, our Brandis Friedman reports that sources tell her in just the last 20 minutes or so, teachers began voting on the city's latest contract proposal. No word yet on how that vote is going. You can find out more tonight at our website, wttw.com news. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast in the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Now, now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.